We are live. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Wonder Series. It is Wonder Series Wednesday, where you get your chance every week to wonder how you can be, do, and think differently, and ultimately how that can help you create the healthy, happy life that you desire. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Denise Stiegel. I am the CEO and curator at Living Healthy List and your host of the Wonder Series. Each month, we talk about a different topic in health, wellness, personal development, and bringing a little bit more fun into life. So this month, we have been talking about communication, different forms of communication, and why it is so important in your life. So that's really why I'm excited to speak to my guest today when it comes to communication, because she is uh, a speaking coach to executives and entrepreneurs, and so, so much more. So my guest today is Mr. Vince Stevenson, and Vince and I got a chance to uh, connect because we are best-selling co-authors of this book, The Successful Body. <laughs> Vince, hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you very much, and uh, it's great to be here, thank you. Thank you. Well, this is really fun because um, I'm gonna pick, pick up the book again, brandish the book, as you say. Brandish the book. <laughs> In The Successful Body, uh, Vince and I, our chapters basically coincide. My chapter, of course, for those of you who know me well, is about eat real food. And Vince's uh, topic essentially is public speaking and how food is um, a big part of uh, a big part of that. Actually, I can tell you the chapter title, which is right here. I had it here. Uh, public speaking, stress and the body. And of course, we know when it comes to stress, eating real food is kind of important. So Vince, tell our guests a little bit more about you, who you are, what you do, and where you are, actually. Okay, well, I'm in London, Southeast London in the UK. And as you said earlier, I run um, a public speaking organization. Uh, we started off very small, but... As time has uh, gone on, we've got something of an international reputation. We've worked all over the world in recent years. And, you know, this, un unfortunately, you know, COVID uh, mm -hmm. hasn't been great for face-to-face -face training, but uh, we've, we've kind of managed to keep our status. And, you know, we, we did a lot of online work. It's, it's, for me, online work is, is a nice substitute, but it's not as good as the real thing, if you know what I mean. So I very much enjoy face-to-face. -face. I really enjoy the, the classroom dynamic. Uh, I think there's a lot of great work happens in the classroom, and it's, it's all to do with the, that group dynamic and how you, especially because my, my specialism is helping people with a fear of public speaking. And often when they arrive, they don't know what they what to expect. They don't know what's going to happen. They're full of trepidation, and they've probably had some, you know, disappointments and disasters uh, in their previous speaking. I know I had when I was younger, and uh, and they bring all of that uh, sort of nervousness and anxiety into the classroom. And uh, and what I I really do, I just ask them to forget everything they know or they think they know about public speaking. And with we're, we're gonna we're gonna start from the beginning. We're gonna we're gonna start from the roots, and we're all gonna grow together. And throughout the classroom exercises and and the work we do, we 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 invite people to again talk about what they know, what they think they know. I know I, t I said that we don't do that, but then then I do I do a lot of that. I say don't worry about X, Y, and Z, and then then I get them to worry about it. Uh, but 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 with with purpose, but with purpose, you know, and because you you want everyone to be really calm, you want people to be receptive. But if if they're anxious and uh, and as you mentioned a moment ago about food, uh, if you're if you're not properly hydrated, if you've not eaten well, uh, the chances of having a really good uh, skills transfer session it's not great so things like your eating your hydration uh, managing your nervousness uh, management you know thinking about your mindfulness being in the moment and trying not to continually worry about the thing that may have been eating away at you for many many years so we have a lot of fun in the classroom um, I try and just demonstrate all the things that you shouldn't do. I'm very good at that, at showing people what not to do. I'm probably and, good at that too. 
Oh no, yeah, well, you know, I think I think we're all, we're all good, and we, we never we never quite forget. You know, I mean, I've been driving for over forty years, and I still uh, screw up when I'm driving. Thankfully, I've not had an accident yet, but you know what I mean. You can still uh, make make the mistakes, and and that's life. And uh, the, the I think if you look at, uh, for example, great athletes uh, who are consistently amazing at what they do, there's a reason why they're consistent, and that's because they practice the right things. They're looking after their health. They're looking after their well-being. They get a great deal of psychological input, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they they just get really consistent outcomes. And that's what we're all looking for, I believe, in in whatever endeavor we're engaged in. You know, whether you're a doctor or you know a surgeon or a lawyer or you know a trainer, whatever you want to do, you want to get really good, consistent outcomes. And, and by doing the right thing at the right time, most of the time, the chances of you scoring highly uh, for yourself and with your audience are you know, greatly enhanced. So when it comes to communication, so many people are afraid, afraid of talking. Communication, mm -hmm. like you and I are chatting, we're communicating. Um, but I think so many times people are afraid to talk to their boss, talk to their spouse, like really communicate mm -hmm. what their needs and desires and hopes are. Why do you think that is the case? Well, there's this really big word that we all don't like, and it's called no. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you know, I, I remember when I worked in the corporate sector, so th there would be awkward situations where you, let's, let's say you go and ask your boss for a raise, and um you you know you kind of get on well with your boss he knows that you're working hard but get getting the kickback getting the knockback rather is uh, you know can be it can it can undermine relationships and i think i i think ideally especially in in the professional world we 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 try to avoid awkward situations where we can uh but then what you also find is that people who don't say what they think and what they feel and they feel that they're being suppressed or that they've been suppressed and they're you know we talk about being authentic but mm -hmm. it's very difficult to be authentic when when you feel that nobody's listening to you or that you're you, you're suppressing yourself and that can be incredibly frustrating mm -hmm. so I'm going to try to address these uh, these issues and maybe you've not got the words or the strategies behind them that are going to get you the outcomes that you're looking for and again that that would just in, induce a level of anxiety that would mean that your performance in that discussion would be suboptimal so you use the word strategy when it comes to communicating whether it's um, in a business situation in a, a personal situation uh, talk to us about strategy okay well you're a, you're a chat show host and so my, my question to you, if I could just throw that one back to you for the moment, how, how, as a communicator, how do you want to appear to your audience? Uh, intelligent, fun, um, intriguing, intrigued. Mm -hmm. Intrigued, yeah. Okay, so those, those are good answers. So um, when I stand in front of my audiences, I want to be trustworthy. I want to demonstrate that I can do it. I want them to know that I'm in their corner and I want them to know that uh, if they make any mistakes, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be holding on to them like maybe uh, some, some horrible boss who's always looking over your shoulder, just waiting for you to make that mistake so he can call you into the office. So I'm my role as a communicator is one, I think generally of somebody who I'm incredibly, I want to be supportive of my audience and I want them to know that they've got what it takes because there was there were times when I was a young man when I just never thought I could do this and I never want, and because I thought I couldn't do it, I never wanted to do it. And then you start putting things off and things take a lot longer than they should do. But if you if you have somebody who can guide you and somebody who can, you know, just show you some of the, the tr let's call them tricks and techniques that can help you get to where you want to go. That's uh, that, that's that's the way I like to communicate. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and like I say, I'm, I, I never go out to, I think a lot of people as well in the corporate sector, they uh, they, they feel like they've, they've got to be better than everybody else. They've got to impress. They've got to be perfect. And, and uh, the whole perfect discussion, I think, I think me, you and I may have had this perfect discussion uh, before. Uh, so let, let me just say that this, this whole thing about public speaking and communication, um, it's a subjective discipline. And there are no subjective criteria for perfection in communication. But, you know, if you look at really good communicators, and I think, I think one thing I would say about the whole TED genre is that TED has given us access to thousands and thousands of really great speakers. And if you look at them, they're all different. And they all come from different uh, countries, different backgrounds, different disciplines. You, you know, they, they come from different families, different educational systems, different pol political systems. There's so many ways, there's so many attributes that we're all diff so different from each other. But I think what makes a good speaker is they, they know who they are and they bring the best of themselves into the moment when they're communicating. Or at least they try to, even if they don't always achieve it. I sometimes I, I you know I go off the stage and I think oh that, that didn't go very well, and but I was at least I was trying and at least I know that I can do it when and when it's good it, it can be great and and some days uh, less so but I, at least I'm always trying to be consistent in what I'm doing and when you find the formula that works for you all you then do as I was suggesting with the with the athlete is you roll it out in your way. And if you're getting really good outcomes consistently, keep, you know, stick with what you've got and keep building on it. Keep building on it all the time. I see. I see where you're coming from. I do see um, I was a college, a high school and college athlete. And you're right. I didn't start out being great at what I did. I was a fencer um, mm -hmm. and, you know, I loved it when I first started. I thought it was interesting. It was different. Um and so I had to, I had to practice. And so realistically to communicate best and to be a public speaker or to be able to speak in public, it really takes practice. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a skill. Uh, and just like uh, driving a car, uh, like, as I said earlier, I'm not the greatest driver now, but <laughs> think, think about your first driving lessons and think about the first time you ever sit behind the wheel of a car with the intention of turning on the ignition that is quite a frightening moment because you're inexperienced you don't have any background knowledge uh, you you might you might have been listening to mum or dad or or your you know your partner or whatever but it's not the same as actually driving the car and the only way you can improve and and by the way you can we have this thing in 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 England called the highway code and it explains the laws of the road to you and you have to take a test um, you know, like a multiple choice type uh, thing so that you you can demonstrate that you know the laws. But what's, what that test doesn't do is show you how to drive safely. And there's only one way you can drive safely, and that's through practicing. And it's exactly the same with public speaking to the extent that public speaking is a skill. It's about doing the right thing at the right time most of the time the good thing in public speaking is if you if you do screw up nobody dies make, make, you might feel awkward for a few minutes but nobody dies if you screw up when you're driving uh you know all sorts of havoc could be wreaked so it's about getting to a point where you, you just feel like you've got the control you know what you're doing and and you can you can get your message across and i think i think that's that's what we want to do but at the very heart of communication, I believe, is trust. If people don't trust you, it doesn't matter what you're saying. It doesn't matter what you're selling. You know, it, it really doesn't matter. People generally don't want to listen to somebody that they don't feel is, is trustworthy. So if you can establish trust very early on in your communication, I, th I think that's one of the, the highlights that you want to aim at. If, if people know that you're trustworthy, if they know that you're sincere, they know that you're a, you know, a decent person. They, they will give you the floor and they'll give you an opportunity to share your, the best of your knowledge and experience. Mm -hmm. That does make sense. You mentioned earlier that 
public speaking was something that you didn't do as a younger mm -hmm. man. And so I'm kind of curious to know what, how, what was the transition that you didn't <laughs> want to do public speaking and this wasn't something you really wanted to do or thought you were good at. And now of course it's, it's such a big part of what you do. Well, um, where, where, do I, where do I begin? So I, I, I wrote, I wrote Mike the Brandish the book. I wrote this book, The Fear Doctor. So this, this is, this is a book that, that is, was written as a compliment for my, my classroom uh, session. So it kind of covers a lot of the exercises and a lot of the discussions is, is in, it, they're in the book. But um, the, the, the opening chapter of The Fear Doctor um, starts with me um, hyperventilating in front of the board of a very large uh, blue chip company in the UK in the mid 80s. So it was the first time I see, I hadn't had any training. Um, nobody had really told me what they wanted me to talk to the board about. So I didn't have the balls to ask them. Uh, I thought they'd think I'm an idiot. So I, I, I go in there with the idea of uh, trying to charm them, uh, but that didn't last very long uh, because I couldn't get my words out. I started sweating profusely you know, uh, heart rate increase. I went purple apparently. And uh, yeah, so all, all of the, the symptoms of uh, extreme anxiety. And and then, then it just went a little bit weirder because uh, I thought I was going to faint. Oh, but no. but the, the, the worst thing was I, I wasn't even good enough to faint. So uh, that, that made things very awkward for people. So they, they sat me down and they, they, they got, uh, they got a book and Waft. It's not laughing. What are you laughing at? It's not funny. I'm so sorry. It's not funny. It's not funny. And uh, so they're wafting me with air, and uh, you know, and uh, would you like some water? This isn't the same glass, by the way. But uh, I hope not. yeah. So then uh, I had like a five minutes. I felt like I blacked out for for a short while, but I don't. But they told me that I didn't. I, I just couldn't speak. I, honestly, I just I just froze, oh, and. Yeah, and then then they sort of ushered me out of the room, and um, now it was it was thoroughly embarrassing because I'd never met these these people before. I'd only been at the company for six weeks, but apparently they heard really good things about me. So I, I made a joke next time I saw them that that was my twin, and <laughs> uh, and he's you know he's locked up in the cellar at home. That's a really bad joke, by the way, and um, so. But they sent me on a course, and what I would say, if I if I have one good personal attribute, it is I'm extremely determined, and I'd love to say I'm the most intelligent guy in the room, uh, and the best speaker in the room, and uh, X, Y, and Z. But I'm none of those things. Uh, what I do do very well is I I grind out results. I work extremely hard. I never give up, and if, if there's something worth fighting for, um, I'm going to be leading the fight, or I'll be up there on the second row. So that that's me. That that I I love I love achieving things, and and by the way, I I need to prove things to myself before I feel I can prove anything to anyone else. So you know, I, I'm probably one of the most skeptical people you might ever meet. But once once I know that this thing. That we're talking about as possible. If it's if I really believe in it, um, I know that I can share that message with people. I think it's important that you actually had that experience, as horrible as it was mm -hmm. at the time, because you really understand what other people are going through, how what they're experiencing. Uh, because I think a lot of times people will come and look for help. You know, whether it's uh, public speaking or uh, health coaching, and yeah they they're just they don't believe the person like you said believable and trustworthy because that person hasn't been through that situation um when it comes to health and wellness um i was talking to somebody recently who is an amazing young woman she's 23 years old and decided she's going to be a life coach and i thought that's great for you know 20 something she's like oh no no for women you know 45 and over and I thought, mm, awkward. Yes, because there's no believability, there's no trust, because she has absolutely no idea what somebody, a woman mm. 45 and over, would be going through. So I think you're right, that trustworthy piece and having gone through that experience, 
And for example, for this young girl, she has mm -hmm. gone through quite a few things and that would be helpful for somebody her age. Yeah, and I think that, um, piece, that that trustworthy piece is really important. And that experience is essential. Yeah, I, th I think when you when you're a trainer, um, th this um, this isn't snow. This is this is experience. You know, <laughs> I like that. I like I like experience. So you do so many other things. Obviously, you have your uh, an incredible teacher, motivator. Um, you're an author. We we have again. We have this book together. We have the Fear Doctor. And how, Fear when, Doctor. Did you, when did the Fear Doctor come out? When did you write that one? On, only well, I actually wrote it over uh, over many years, but. Um, I had a problem getting it published. I tried to create. I tried to do it in Create Space, but I just kept hitting problems. And uh, because the business was going very, very well, I, I it just kept losing priority. So it didn't happen until, <coughs> excuse me, I think when uh, in the first lockdown last year, um, I I found this woman in England, a Russian woman, and um, she does, you know, the whole publishing thing. So uh, it wasn't inexpensive, but she, I got to say, she did, I think she did a great job and she, she got it up there and uh, I'm really, yeah, I, I'm really proud of the book. I think it's a good book. And um, I, the, my only regret is it took so long. And, and the second regret is that uh, I think I, I would have loved my mum to have seen the book. I think she'd been really proud to, uh, to have held her son's book in her hand, but uh, Sadly, she's no longer with us. I'm sorry to hear that. Mm -hmm. I think the Fear Doctor, I think everyone needs to take a look at, you know, buy their, their copy. Can can they find it on Amazon? Oh, yeah, it's it's on Amazon. You can just, in fact, if you just type in the Fear Doctor or Vince Stevenson. Can I, can I tell you the story behind the handle, the Fear Doctor? Of course, uh, I, you did say, I, actually, I was going to ask you about that because when I asked you uh, on your form when you were when we were communicating initially, you had put, I had asked, you know, what is your title? And you said the Fear Doctor. And I didn't understand that until later after I started uh, getting to know you more, what, what the Fear Doctor was. So please do tell. Okay, me. so we... Uh, you, I'm sure. I'm sure you've got uh, the same thing in, in America, but I, I, I just don't know any examples. But in England, we have um, we have uh, Mr. Motivator. So th there's this guy. He's you know he's got his lycra gear on and he's brilliant in the gym and he shows he shows you all of these exercises that you do to music, and he's very very popular. So but nobody knows his real name. Or maybe his mum remembers his real name, but I, I I couldn't tell you his real name. But I know him as Mr. Mo if I saw him on TV, if I saw him in the streets, Mr. Motivator. Everybody gets Mr. Motivator. But there's also this woman called Super Granny. And what she does is she helps mums who are having difficulties with their children, you know, behavioral things. And uh, and she goes into the house and, and she kind of comes up with some solutions that will work for the kids. And and again, for, for a long time, she was on television. She's very popular. And, and I just thought, do you know what? Nobody can remember my name. Vince Stevenson is there's just too many syllables for for most nice ordinary people. Um, but very interestingly, if if you search for the fear doctor, you'll find me. So you don't have to remember Vince Stevenson. It's so it's just purely a marketing handle, and people remember me and they they tell me uh, you know they pass my my credentials on to their colleagues, which is really nice. Vince, that's brilliant. I love it. I'm going to have to come up with one for myself now because mm. like you, my Denise Stegall, there's too, there's too many. Yeah, it's too many, too many, too many, yeah, too many syllables. Unfortunately, even with my maiden name, I, my maiden name is Stag. I was Denise Stag blah, to Stegall. Mm. There's just way too many S's. So I think, too I'm, many. I think I've just learned a little tidbit. I need to find a handle. Actually, okay. we did have um, the super granny. We did have her on uh, television here in the U.S. Okay. Well, she, we, we may have stolen her from you. I'm, I can't remember. It's, it's been a while. It has been a while. I'm not sure. So I'm looking at your photo with your name and people can find you at Vince Stev mm -hmm. <laughs> or at Boomers on Books. Tell yes. us about Boomers on Books. Boomers on Books. Well, where do I begin? So Boomers on Books, it's myself and a chap, uh, an American guy. He's, he he used to live in Oregon. He now lives in Florida. 
but um, he's called Mark Schultz and he's a great um, copywriter. And, uh, you know, he, he edits books and he, he's brilliant with spelling. And, you know, if your, your book's got any spelling or typos or, you know, grammatical mistakes, uh, he's been doing that for 40 years. Now, he did a book promotion for me just before Christmas. And uh, like I say, he's just a, just a, a year or two older than me. But he and I, we got on really, really well. And um, we decided uh, how can we stay together? How can we keep in touch? And we came up with this idea of um, interviewing authors. So I was an author and he works with authors and we, we just thought it would be fun. Uh, so like I said, this, this was in a, in a situation where, you know, I, I was still being furloughed, so I wasn't at work and I had a, a fair amount of time on my hands. And I, I kind of I rather like this idea of being a chat show host and putting that on my CV as well. So speaker, writer, author, chat show host, It's uh, that sounded fun. So we, well, you know Eric, Eric Severson. So Eric, Eric did the successful uh, mind book with us. And uh, so my first, our first guest was Eric. And five minutes before the inaugural session, I get a message from Mark saying that his wife had taken ill. And um, and I'm thinking, so I'm going to be doing this on my own. Now, to be fair, I'd, I'd kind of been setting things up. Um, we've got StreamYard like you're using now. and uh, But again, I, I, I didn't really know what I was doing with it. But I thought um, we'd, we'd done a pilot with Eric for 20 minutes and it, it went very well. So we just thought, I just thought, you know what? I'm a trainer. I'm usually prepared for anything. Things go wrong. Things go missing. You improvise, and uh, and 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 I did it on my own. And and you know what? It, the hour just passed like that. It went really well. I think uh, Eric had a good time. I had a great time, and and we had one recording under the belt. And like I say, unfortunately, uh, Mark's wife has been very ill. She needed a lot of physical therapy. She was having three sessions a week. Uh, so there's uh, when he was living in Oregon, there's an eight hour time difference. So that made things very difficult with with all of that. So I've, I've kind of um, and since Mark has moved to uh, to Florida with his family and uh, I guess he's, he's still got a job. Well, I know he's got a job and, uh, you know, move, moving house is hard enough in England. But yeah, I guess moving from the west coast to the east coast would take a while for everything to settle down yeah, so <laughs> yeah so in the in the last ooh, five months i think i've done nearly 200 uh interviews of of indie authors and, and a few you know published authors and i've had a great time and and for me because i've not been in the classroom it's it's been great to meet so many very very interesting people you know, really, you know, I've read some of their books. I, there isn't time to read 200 people's books in, in that time. But the the books that I've read, I really enjoyed. And, and talking to the authors and finding out about their techniques and what's on their mind and how they do things and go about things. Uh, I found it incredibly useful and motivational. And, and again, it's kind of kept my, my mind occupied. And um, like, as I said, just do, I always... You know, we, I was telling you about uh, what happened the first time I made a speech to the board mm -hmm. of of that company. <laughs> I lo I love doing things for the first time now because you don't you don't know anything about yourself. You don't know what you're capable mm -hmm. of until you have dive in there. Yep. You've got no idea, and you could. There's only one way of finding out, and if it's something that you like and it's something that you can derive pleasure from, uh, why not dive in a little bit deeper and see see what opportunities there are now again I, I don't think i'm going to you know I don't, I don't think cnn are going to pick me up and, and offer me a you know a five million dollar job but like i say i'm it, that does, that's that's immaterial i'm having a great time i'm meeting lots of interesting people i think it keeps me nice and fresh i like the conversation i have, I have a lot of fun and and the interviews go so quickly and um just like this one we've been talking for nearly 30 minutes and I know, uh great. Yeah, we've, we've we've barely we've barely touched on any of the subjects that we could have discussed so far. So, <laughs> oh, well, so it's it's, yeah. it's just fun. It's just fun. I think it's great, and and people can find Boomers on Books where. Uh, Boomers on Books. Uh, well, if you if you go to Twitter, 
it's at boomers on books so we um, mark came up with the title booms on books uh, because because uh, we're both in our, our early 60s and uh, and we're both very interested in in either reading or writing books or publishing books so uh, we, we thought it was an appropriate title just just one caveat with that and that is that uh, some people that we've approached would, would you like to be on the on the show uh, they say oh i'm not a boomer yet and i said no no, no, no it's the it's the people who are interviewing who are the boomers it doesn't matter how old how old you are you know we, we don't discriminate yeah we don't discriminate for younger people yeah well, that's that's great. Well, we've got we've got a boomer upstairs. Well, actually, he's not upstairs. He's gone to work already. Uh, my husband's a boomer, and it's kind of funny how um, you know generationally, you know, we have these different names, and at the same time, we love the same things. So mm. I always think it's kind of fun. Um, okay, I think I think the age thing, you know, your age is just a number. It's uh, it's not significant in how you live your life. I agree. I think it's really important. I think you make a great point. You know even through COVID, you are still doing things and you're learning and expanding your mind and your experiences. And I, I think that is essential for people because I my fear is people are just getting so used to being home and not mm -hmm. moving forward. Um, yet here we are, you've you're in, you've got this book coming out. I know you're, um, you've got Boomers on Books, um, The Fear Doctor, you have so many things going on and it's a great, you're a great example of somebody who just said, you know what, I've got the time. Let's do something with it. So okay. Really appreciate that. Well, we've been writing nonfiction stuff, but this, this last uh, few weeks. Um, so I'm a member of a writer's group in Southeast London hmm. and uh, the call went out a few weeks ago. They, every, every year they produce an anthology of uh, short stories and poems so i am diving into fiction which is something i've never done well i've certainly never shown any of anyone any of my fiction but <laughs> um but i i feel like i feel confident enough that uh well i'm going to submit them there's no guarantee that they'll, they'll think that they they are worthy but there's only one way of finding out and if and if they like them great and if they don't you know I, i'll keep trying absolutely one of the things that I, I say when it, when it comes to trying something new, like you said, if you don't try something new, you'll never know if you like it. I always say that I have to try something new three times before I can decide if it's for me. Because the first time I'm usually scared to death and can't think beyond that. The second time I still have a little bit of fear, but I'm kind of going thinking, okay, well, I've done this before and I survived. By the third time, I think I've got it. I can do this. So again, it's it's a matter of trying and sticking to it. Sometimes the first time you do something, it could be a disaster. Mm -hmm. I've tried skiing. I am not a skier. I have tried. I've given it the college, really, tr truly given it the college try. First okay. of all, caveat, I am deathly afraid of heights, but I have still tried. Um, I've... <laughs> I've fallen more than I've actually skied down a mountain. Um, I've tried in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, I've tried in Canada, probably not the best places to learn how to ski. Um, but truly, after the third time, I finally said, okay, I was half, I'd fallen down a ton of times, second run down a mountain in uh, Alberta. Uh, and I finally just decided, you know what, this isn't for me. I tried it probably as a kid three or four times. And as an adult, three times, this was my third time. I finally said, you know what? I'm not good at this. I will find something else. I'm really good at reading a book by the fireside in the lodge. <laughs> that's, um, that's, that's one way of doing it. That's one way to do it. Do you want to hear a good, um, do you want to hear my first skiing experience? Oh, please. So a very good friend of mine invited me to go skiing uh, with him and, uh, and a group. So I'd never been before. I didn't even have the gear and I didn't know what, you know, I really didn't know. Um, and nobody in my family had been, I didn't know anybody who'd been skiing. I, I always thought skiing was, uh, I'd seen it on television. It looked great, but then they make it look so easy, of course. So I thought, oh yeah, I'm a footballer. I can, you know, I'm a soccer player. I can, I can do that. And uh, so we get on the slope. Now this, this is April in the, in the Alps, the French Alps and it just happens to be very hot and and there's a lot of melt water 
So what happens is when you fall, you get absolutely soaked. Oh, no. So, so yeah, there are huge puddles. And the guy said to me, keep away from the puddles. Whatever you do, don't ski through the puddles. Now, what happens, and, and by the way, if you're, if you're skiing on, on snow, which is a good idea, and, and then, you, then you see some grass or mud underneath the snow, don't ski on Ooh. the muddy bit. Because what happens is, as one ski is on the mud and the other ski is on the snow, your your skis yeah. are going at different speeds and whoosh, oh, <laughs> there goes your groin, you know? So you gotta be, now again, when, when somebody tells you that and you're not paying attention, you just say, oh yeah, 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 you know, no problem. And uh, so I was skiing with um, with my friend's uh, French girlfriend and, and she was she was doing her absolutely best to help me but i kept falling over yeah and um so she smoked a lot this this young lady a very nice lady by the way and um so i would i would be falling over and my skis were all over the place and every time i fell over face down she would ski over to me sit on my bottom and smoke a cigarette and uh, she'll say you'll get the hang of this before i stop smoking you know so, oh, no. so it helped. It helped a lot, you know. I mean, I, I got to know a lot of people. I was waving to people from my prone position. It was, uh, it was, it was a lot of fun, you know. And um, I, I improved on my skiing that week. It was good. I was going to say, and do you still ski? I haven't. I, I, do you know what? I haven't skied since I got married, uh, and only for the reason that my wife is Brazilian, and if we have any spare cash, we like to go to Brazil. Uh, Skiing in in Europe is pretty expensive. I guess it's expensive uh, in is, America yeah, as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's it's a, it's it's a great sport, but it's an expensive sport. But I I think I think because my my wife moved halfway around the world to be with me, I th I, th I think it's only fair to take my wife and daughter to be to be with them and their family. I would agree. Well, Vince, this is amazing. You and I can talk so many different things and i would certainly love to have you come back again and let's talk about sure more about what's going on and you know your uh let us know what happens with uh with the with the the fiction book that'll be really interesting um before we go though i want you to give us one tip one last tip one quick thing it could be something you've already told us when it comes to communication public speaking what's the first thing somebody needs to do I th well, the, 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 there are a lot of things. You know, it's, uh, it's it's a bit like driving. There's a lot of things going on simultaneously. I always talk about public speaking as a as a physiological and a psychological event. Uh, so you need to think about your delivery. Think about your stance. Think about the way you position yourself. We want to sit. We want to stand up straight. That will help with your breathing. You know, if if you're you know if you're sitting down for any length of time. Uh, you've got this muscle round about your solar plexus called the diaphragm and it's not engaged. So your voice will never have the real strength and resonance that it could do if you're standing up straight. So standing up straight is good. Uh, I think if you can do some good deep breathing exercises, uh, that, that will help as well. Being able to get as much oxygen up into your head is vitally important. An average brain weighs about 1.4 kilos. Um, I weigh 88 kilos, but my brain uses 20% of my body's oxygen. Mm -hmm. So by breathing effectively, getting that, that, that fuel for your body and your brain, the oxygen up there where you need it can have a huge impact on, on your delivery and the, you know, and the, and the vocal quality that you can deliver. So those, those are just, just some very simple tips, but on the, on the other side, the delivery side, you want to think about your structure, having a good beginning, having a good middle, and and having some something nice and conclusive, something strong to end with that will make it memorable, and and hopefully people will remember you and they'll remember the message. I love it. Thank you so much, Vince, for this great conversation. Everybody, thank you for listening and joining us here on the Wonder Series. Don't forget, check out Boomers on Books on Twitter and on YouTube. Correct. YouTube. And on YouTube. Oh, yes, and on YouTube. And on YouTube. And 
We will be here next week for Wonder Series Wednesday. Have a great week, everyone. Until I see you next time, healthy living, happy life. Have a great one. See you then.